Hello, everyone. We'll start the uh, presentation in about a minute. We'll wait for everyone to uh, settle in. Thank you. Once again, we'll start the presentation in about 30 seconds as we wait for everyone to settle in. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Audits and Inspections Best Practices, How Knowing the Basics Can Boost Your Safety Program, presented by KPA. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor at Safety and Health Magazine. I'm moderating today's presentation. On behalf of the National Safety Council, we hope that you, your loved ones, and all the people in your lives are remaining safe and healthy wherever they are. We'll start the presentation in a couple minutes, but first there are some housekeeping items. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily affect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type your question, and click the send button. Please feel free to ask your question anytime during this presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we might not get to every question. The good news is that any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsor. Also after this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and I'll tell you more about that a little later. This webcast will be archived so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our speaker. With us today is Mike Brenner, Team Supervisor for KPA's Northeast District. Since joining KPA in 2014, Mike has helped clients from Maryland to New England with their regulatory and loss control programs. He also has extensive experience with safety and environmental audits, training managers and employees, and improving workplace safety culture. Additionally, he holds an ASP certification from the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. More recently, Mike has helped KPA and its clients adapt to health and safety concerns caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, we thank you all for tuning in to this presentation. Mike, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks very much, Alan. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I do look forward to speaking with you about your audit and inspection programs and how they can help to supplement uh, your on-site safety and compliance uh, and environmental compliance culture. So my, uh, my background with KPA, as Alan mentioned, these past seven years, extensively focused on the auditing side uh, and, you know, on the, uh, uh, well, excuse me, the uh, types of businesses that we work with range from automotive to collision to manufacturing to warehouse things are pretty, pretty wide range, featuring a, a, a robust kind of set of circumstances that I'm sure many of you encounter at your own workplaces. So what we'll be kind of discussing today is... Whoops, there we go. Uh, really going to be um, the critical components of a workplace safety and environmental compliance and loss control program of which audits and inspections uh, are really just one part. But you'll see over the course of uh, our discussion how that fits into the larger kind of product that you're trying to uh, deliver, which is a safe workplace. So KPA, just a very brief bit of background here. We are a consulting company that specializes, as I said, in compliance, it takes the form of on-site services in the form of consulting, on-site training, blending that with online training and issue management uh, and program development. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more in general terms, but about how um, you know good software and good tracking can really help to supplement what you may already be doing and why it's so important as part of the development of a a well-functioning uh, safety program. Our agenda for today, just really, uh, we're gonna start with the basics. How are we defining audits and inspections? What, how are they similar? What sets them apart? There is, of course, going to be a bit of overlap on these items, but we're, we'll talk about the very important differences that you're gonna wanna keep in mind as you're doing each one of these, because they do have different sort of purposes um, and, and functions. 
Uh, not all audits are created equal. There are different types. So we're going to break down both the internal and external audits that you want to be kind of conscious of. Why bother doing them at all? What kind of benefits might we hope to see as a result of doing these audits and inspections? And kind of what's it all for? What do we do afterwards with that information having completed an audit? Where do we go from there? So we'll start with inspections. And it, this one is it's kind of the, the simpler of the two. It really is just kind of a face value approach. We're, we're doing a, a walkthrough at the facility. We're making a determination on compliance or loss control from a, a safety and or environmental point of view, kind of a yay or nay ruling. Um, and a lot of times it's going to be focused on specific pieces of equipment or specific parts of the building, uh, physical hazards, physical facilities, and the uh, protective measures and engineering controls that are designed to mitigate any hazards uh, around those, those specific areas. So the types of questions that might be found in an inspection, uh, you know, just to give a few examples, are chemical containers labeled? Comes pretty black and white from, uh, from the OSHA regulations on hazard communication. Any boxes blocking exit routes or emergency equipment? Again, just a face value determination there. Uh, is our machinery well maintained? Any safeguards, engineering controls? Are they, are they functioning? Are they present and in good working condition? We get into the employee level, of course, sometimes. Are our workers wearing all the necessary personal protective equipment or PPE? Uh, and is our emergency equipment serviceable? We may, you know, uh, sort of miss the, the broader or, or the, uh, the more specific function uh, functionality of that equipment if we're not taking a close enough look at it during a, a specific inspection. Now, obviously, in the case of uh, certain types of equipment, and uh, be, whether it's emergency equipment or uh, or machinery or uh, you know workplace equipment, OSHA is going to just spell out very clearly how frequently these inspections have to be done. So it takes all the guesswork out of it, which I guess is the good news. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, you know, but when we get into audits, you'll see it's not quite so clearly delineated. It is important to think about who's going to do these inspections, though. You don't really necessarily want just the closest able-bodied individual who can hold a clipboard and a pen. Um, it's it's got to be somebody who really knows what they're looking for. And a lot of times that's going to be your managers, your supervisors, foremen, things like that. Um, not really, obviously, one specific job title, but somebody who can uh, make an accurate determination on the compliance and the functionality of a certain uh, set of circumstances. So we want to know what we're looking for. And a lot of times it's very, very kind of obvious if we're thinking in the case of, let's say, an eyewash station. Uh, you know, if it's a portable eyewash station that we're going to be filling, uh, you know, and mounting on the wall, you need to make sure that thing is actually, you know, not only accessible, but is it filled? Is it, is it uh, does it have fresh liquid in it? That, that type of thing. Fire extinguishers, again, uh, in good working condition, is it charged, et cetera. Um, now, all that sounds pretty obvious. And in, in many cases, it's going to be a very quick determination. But of course, sometimes with more specialized equipment, you know, forklifts, cranes, that sort of thing, not everyone will necessarily know what, you know, what to look for. So again, we need to think critically about, do we have the right person doing this inspection uh, or are they just kind of checking a box? In my audits, I can't tell you how many times this comes up where it's, there's a, let's say an extinguisher hanging up on the wall where it always is. The thing is empty. It was used, you know, maybe a few months ago. Somebody has been faithfully signing that tag every month, but the thing's been empty for you know, who knows how long. So, you know, we're, if, if we're not actually, doing anything beyond signing a tag or a clipboard, obviously we're missing an important piece of the puzzle there. And I, I've seen the same thing for eyewash stations, for forklifts. It's, uh, it's important not only to have the documentation, but the follow through as well to ensure that any, any deficiencies are corrected, which of course is the point of the inspection. Uh, off to the right, of course, you see just kind of a uh, more of a facilities issue, not going to be a specific um, you know, regulatory um, tag or anything like that for, for a, a busted rail but it's gonna come up in a facilities inspection and obviously would need to be documented and uh, some corrective action implemented. So we'll, we'll bounce a little bit back and forth between audits and inspections, but now we're gonna get a little bit more into the audit side of things. Now, whereas the inspections, as I said, were just kind of the face value approach, the audits are gonna be a bit more in depth. They're gonna be a bit more um, sort of broad in a way, and they're gonna be fo focused more on the system at the facility, at the safety systems that you have in place, than the inspection itself would. The inspection focus on a very kind of particular uh, you know, either checklist or piece of equipment and the, the audit is gonna be, you know, how, how are our programs functioning as a whole? And so what this really means in practice, we're gonna have a series of observations. We need to be 
kind of drilling down, pairing all those observations or excuse, observations with a series of questions to determine, you know, what what is going wrong here, if anything, uh, and then how do we work to resolve it? So, as an example here, we have an employee who is not wearing the proper PPE. We need to think about why that is. We're, we're not just making a de determination. We got to think how can we figure out really what could explain that. Uh, that observation. So in this case, we might be asking, do we have a policy that's going to clearly delineate uh, what PPE should be worn in certain areas that outlines our expectations? Uh, was that PPE available to the employee? Did they run out? You know, maybe it was provided when they started three years ago, but they, you know, lost it or it got busted or, uh, or whatever it was. They never sought a replacement. Maybe the replacement was not available. So again, it's, it's sometimes it's just as simple as Oh, well, that's the explanation. We just got to stock some more, you know, uh, some more safety glasses, whatever the case may be. And that employees understand where to find this equipment in, in this particular example. Let's say the equipment was available. We have a policy, but the training was not sufficient or wasn't done at all for that particular employee. Um, they you know, may just have been issued the PPE on day one and never really had any kind of explanation of, you know, what was expected in terms of uh, location or frequency or any kind of enforcement at all necessarily um, as to uh, the, the reason or the uh, really the importance of, of following that policy. And that's going to be kind of an ongoing, uh, you know, uh, I guess, goal to meet. Uh, the, the, you know, obviously, the goalpost always kind of moving when it comes to things like that. And, it, you know, we'll, again, we'll get into some more examples a little bit further on in the discussion. And finally, in this particular example, what measures are we taking to ensure that the policy, in this case, PPE usage, is being followed. Do we have any kind of positive incentives? Is there any enforcement? Just this week at one of my audits, uh, I encountered a situation where an employee was struck by uh, a, an item that flew out from a uh, hydraulic press under a tremendous amount of pressure, struck him on the forehead. He was, I would deem, uh, quite lucky not to have sustained a much more serious injury. Um, and naturally, as you know, the first thing you might wonder was he wearing an uh, impact resistant face shield? The answer was no. And, uh, you know, he had safety glasses on in this case, but not the face shield, which should have also been part of that ensemble when dealing with, with that piece of equipment. And uh, historically, there had not been much uh, either enforcement or incentive to have that face shield equipped when using the equipment. So, you know, it's sometimes, of course, you learn the hard way, we'll get into the accident side of things uh, before too long. But we want to think about, okay, do we have a policy? Maybe we do, we have the PPE available. In this case, yes, was the employee trained? No, not necessarily well enough. Uh, and finally, did we do anything to ensure that it was going to be followed, that the policy was going to be followed? In this case, the answer was no. It, again, the hard part sometimes is the will to enforce these policies, as we'll discuss a little bit later as well. So the key here, is we may have a great program, a great policy, but that needs to be audited as well. We can't just kind of hold that at face value and say, okay, we, we got the program, we're all set there. We need to actually audit that program to see, is it holding up? Is it meeting our needs? Is anything unclear or left open to too much interpretation, too ambiguous? Uh, so let's make sure that gets audited along with the facility. Again, that's one of the places where the audit is different from the inspection because if we get into some of the, the paperwork and the programs, we might find that that's where the deficiency lies is in the system itself. So these audits really can you piece all that together, you get a sense of the effectiveness of a facility's safety culture. And when you know you're, you've been kind of in the habit for a while, both on the managerial and the employee level, uh, been doing consistent audits, consistent follow through from those audits, employees are buying in ideally as a result of all of that. The safety culture really starts to be sort of a self-sustaining way to to manage loss control and compliance because it's just part of the, the routine. It's part of the behavior that everybody engages in, um, and it's not you know having to constantly catch up and re-engage, reinvent the wheel. Everyone really is already bought in. That's obviously the dream of any loss controller or compliance specialist, and that's what you know. Again, we're always kind of continuing to to try to improve to reach that target to get the full engagement from from really both sides, the manager and the, the employee. So we, we just started talking a bit about our programs and policies. So we need to really think about, you know, where these deficiencies might be coming from. And again, ask a lot of critical questions. And we, we talked in a couple of cases about some examples already, but 
just first and foremost, do we have a, an, a program for whatever problem we may have observed? And if we don't, you know, why not? Should we have one? Is it incorporated somehow in another program, but maybe we need to expand it into its own thing? Uh, again, just to kind of make it as simple and clear as possible to the affected employees and managers. Do those programs that we already have, are they meeting our goals? So if we have, we might have a, a very robust let's say forklift safety program, or, or let's say respiratory protection program. Um, but we, we consistently have issues where, you know, we're observing in our audits, you know, the, let's say respirators are not being worn properly, or it's the wrong kind of respirator, or they're used past their expiration date, whatever the case may be. Again, the program is great, but it's not meeting our goals if we're consistently observing problems with them. I mentioned forklift a moment ago, obviously plenty of, of potential consequences to um, uh, ineffective forklift safety program as well. And again, the program may not be enough. That's going to be one of the refrains of our discussion today is any one of these pieces by itself is important, but it's not nearly enough to, to really achieve the goal that you want, which is to have you know as zero or as close to zero incidents as possible, either on the compliance or loss control side of things. So it, we need to think about how and why it's not meeting our needs and look at ways to, to amend them on an ongoing basis. Who developed these programs? Where did they come from? Was it uh, you know somebody twenty years ago who you know just kind of happened to be there at the time and 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 threw together kind of what they thought was best? Maybe they had a very uh, specialized knowledge in a narrow focus for a particular uh, piece of equipment or a particular set of circumstances, but they may not have had the the regulatory background to know what should be in there, or they weren't thinking far enough ahead or far outside of their scope. A lot of ways that a program can be lacking. Uh, so it's important, again, to continuously revisit these. And if the person who wrote up that program, if we're thinking critically, if they may not have had necessarily the right background to do it, well, that's probably a good time to say, okay, what might, what might we have missed here? Uh, do we need to do a page one rewrite? Can we make some tweaks here and there with, you know, in conjunction with folks who, who may be a little bit better equipped to do it? Um, and that can be either internal or external. You may, you may decide, well, we don't really have anybody on site who we feel is up to the task of writing a really robust and, and effective lockout tagout program. We're gonna need some outside help there. That's always an option, of course. It's the on-site folks who, who, who will need to manage the program, uh, but they don't necessarily have to be the ones who develop it. Um, although they should be obviously involved in that discussion. Uh, already kind of alluded to this just now, but when were the programs last updated? Um, it's gonna be something that should be audited in, in conjunction with the facility, uh, whatever frequency that, that your facility deems necessary. Uh, it may not need changes every time, uh, but it, it should be at least given a good review to determine is it meeting our needs and what kind of changes might be needed here. This is an important one here. And one of the more challenging things is, is do the employees and managers understand the programs? I was talking PPE a moment ago, but of course you can apply this to really any set of circumstance. I mentioned lockout tag out. Uh, you know, the program may be top notch, you know, state of the art, but does every affected employee and manager, do they understand what's in it? How are we training them on it? In other words, are we locking them in a, in a room with a, you know, 14 inch thick binder for a few hours and they don't come out until they, you know, they're singing the gospel of lockout tag out? Well, might not be as effective as an actual training program. We need to think about what does that training look like? Are we doing you know, one-on-one -on -one instruction? Is it is it online modules? Is it hands-on practical exercises? You know, not, not necessarily a right answer here. It's really very circumstantial, depending on your facility and uh, the type of training, uh, the type of, uh, I guess, goal we're trying to meet on the training side or what we're being trained on. Um, but this should be audited as well. What does what that training program look like? And, it, you know, how could it possibly be improved? And if you're seeing any kind of deficiencies in the facility audit, we, again, we got to go back to the program. We think about, okay, program's great, but how are we determining the understanding? How can we tweak that delivery of the, uh, of the content? And the perennial question, all been kind of leading up to this, how can our program be improved? That, of course, will cascade down to the actual uh, facility performance of the, the goals that we're trying to reach here. So that, that will always be, that question really will never go away because there's always going to be some room to improve. We need to think about, you know, what we can do to, to uh, achieve that goal. So we know a little bit more about inspections and audits. We got to think now about how frequently we're going to do them. Inspections usually pretty straightforward. 
I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there's a lot of cases where the frequency is is determined simply by the regulation. Uh, you know, and you know, we have a few examples here. We're talking annual inspections for automotive lifts, cranes, fire doors, extinguishers, etc., all the way down to a daily inspection for forklifts, or in some cases, multiple times a day if you have a multi-shift operation where the forklift would have to be inspected at the beginning of each shift, and it not only inspected for all of these but documented as well. Uh, so that, of course, you know, again, pretty, at least the, the hard part of, of knowing, you know, what to look for and, and how frequently to do it, that's all spelled out pretty clearly by the regulation. Now, the audits themselves, uh, that's going to be uh, sort of up to the facility itself. Uh, there's not going to be, a, there's no regulation that says you have to do, you know, uh, an audit at certain frequency because it's different than the inspection. Uh, so it's going to be determined by either, let's say, loss control targets or previous audit performance, um, you know, that you, you know, if we had a lot of deficiencies in the last few years, we might start to do instead of an annual audit, that might get bumped up to say twice a year, three, four times a year uh, as needed. Uh, so again, it's really just going to be determined by uh, each individual facility for itself. But the key is, they're going to be continuous. We're not just a one and done type of operation here, because we need to know how are we improving audit after audit, any kind of uh, repeat offenses or or wins, right? I mean, on the other, on the flip side, what are we seeing that's improved? That should all be accounted for as well. And they need to be frequent enough to ensure that we're, we're achieving all of our loss control and compliance goals. Now, even if we have a set schedule, the circumstances that we run into throughout the year may, may kind of require us just by default almost to do an additional audit ahead of schedule. So that might be, we had a serious accident. We need to think about what circumstances led to that accident. Uh, and that audit, or if, let's say employee complaint or regulatory concern, th those audits are probably going to be a bit more narrow in their scope, of course. And if we have a, a forklift related injury that prompts us to kind of revisit this, we may not need to look at our hazard communication program. We're going to probably stick to the forklift uh, and, and make to our, our uh, efforts really count more. And we'll, we'll hit hazard communication during the next regular audit. So uh, it, it, obviously efficiency of time is, is important here. I mean, it's easy enough to talk about all this on paper, but the reality is audits, audits can take a lot of time. We need to be smart about how we're using that time. Right, sorry about that. So let's revisit training a little bit here. We talked a bit about you know why it's so important and employee buy-in obviously is, is is critical to the uh the proper execution of a safety program again a common reframe we may have a great program by itself that's not going to do much for us to achieve our goals we have to ensure that the people actually who are covered by that program are the ones who, who are following it they need to in order to follow it they need to understand what's in it and they need to be kind of guided through it so proper training and proper and effective training going to be very uh, important and necessary to help to achieve that goal. And uh, one of the things that you can think about when you're designing a training program or delivering training is to have a SMART goal. SMART being an acronym here that some of you may be familiar with that stands for Specific, Measurable, Actionable, Relevant, and Time Bound. And that's really going to keep us on task and, and focused on what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to achieve it. So just to kind of illustrate that, we have a good example and a bad example. Good example, we can say we want to see 100% adherence to our eye protection policy in the manufacturing shop by September 30th and in subsequent monthly audits. So in this case, we probably had a rash of, of pretty serious eye injuries and we're trying to buckle down and really drive some improvement in that specific area. A bad example would be, let's increase eye protection usage, right? We can clearly see what's sort of lacking there. It's not specific. It's not really measurable either. Um, and it's, it's really just not going to help us to, to think, when will we know that we've achieved it, right? There's nothing really that's going to help us point to that. So um, you keep it, you know, very, uh, very specific and focused. And obviously, um, you know, the, the results will be uh, very easily observable once you have that in place. Right, actually, one last thing I wanted to mention on this one, I, I believe I, I'll address it again towards the end. But when you're thinking about how to deliver training, Obviously, there's a lot of ways of doing it. I mentioned a few of them earlier. Uh, I also mentioned efficiency. So we need to make sure we're kind of balancing efficiency and effectiveness kind of on a gradient. Um, you know, we, the, the most effective way people are going to learn most likely is going to be with either small group, the, uh, small direct conversations. Uh, so it might be a one-on-one -on -one or a small group of people. That's going to be, of course, more effective than sending out, you know, an email or posting something on the bulletin board. 
Now there might be great content in that stuff and it's very efficient, a very efficient way to deliver it, but it, it's probably not going to be retained quite as well. So again, you, you'll have to make the decision for your own facility, but we have to think about, you know, balancing those two things um, and trying to think ahead, you know, is this going to achieve our goal or is it just checking a box and saying, yeah, hey, we did the training, uh, even if it's just, you know, a sheet of paper that may, may not be retained all that well. And obviously, you know, hands-on instruction, uh, it can be a much more effective tool. So other types of audits we want to be thinking about, we spent all our time so far talking about internal auditing that you yourselves or somehow within the company are arranging. But as some of you may have some firsthand experience, of course, that's not the only type of audit that you may encounter. A lot of regulatory bodies out there who have the duty to enforce the regulations that will keep our workers safe or our environment healthy. Uh, and you sometimes can expect that they will come onto your facility and, and do an audit themselves. Now, there's a number of situations that would bring them out. Depends, again, entirely on your facility and the circumstances there. Uh, you know, if OSHA comes out, a lot of times that's going to be the result of either a serious injury or an employee complaint. Uh, their their uh, scope likely will be a little bit more focused on one of the, you know, what, whatever circumstance led them to come in in the first place. So the, your audits are probably going to be a bit broader than, let's say, an OSHA audit. But the key, of course, is you won't know what brings them in ahead of time. So you have to be ready for, for kind of for anything. Um, so a lot of times the, the audit, whether it's OSHA, EPA, DOT, they're going to be doing not only a facility walkthrough, but they'll, they'll check the paperwork as well. So obviously, we spend a lot of time talking about your written programs. Those, of course, are fair game, accident logs, waste disposal records, uh, tier two reporting, spill prevention, control and countermeasure plans, et cetera. So, um, you know, again, kind of being ready for anything here. Uh, and we'll talk again about it, sort of how your audit and the regulatory audit will kind of work hand in hand. Another type of audit in a way here, uh, I'll, I'll consider it a type of audit is accident investigation. Uh, and the unfortunate reality here, every accident uh, as, as unfortunate as they are, they're also, they have to be a learning opportunity, right? Because if they aren't, we're missing, uh, we're missing kind of the point of, of the accident investigation in the first place. If, if we're not learning something from it, it could happen again. And we need to really effectively audit what happened, how it happened, what we can do to prevent it from happening in the future. The ultimate goal here being, uh, you know, again, answering that question, how can this be, how could this have been prevented? So the root cause analysis going to be uh, the tool by which we, we arrive at that, at hopefully the answer to that question. Now, in order to do an effective accident investigation, just like an effective audit, we want to think about who is going to be in charge of running that investigation. Uh, you know, why are we choosing that individual? Do they have familiarity with uh, that part of the shop or that piece of equipment? You know, whatever the case may be, um, that individual should be equipped with basically like a kit of uh, that's going to help to speed up that that process right from the start of it. So, accident investigation sheets, Im Im important phone numbers to call uh, to keep in mind whether it's facility personnel or off-site emergency responders, camera, that sort of thing, anything that's going to just cut down on the logistical effort involved with getting to the meat of the, of the root cause analysis. So once, I, once we have uh, determined, hopefully we've arrived at a conclusion, what was that root cause? What's that preventative measure? That preventative measure really should be communicated with the rest of the employees who could wind up in the same position. Now, there's no reason, of course, to, to single out an employee and probably shouldn't be doing that um, when you're having that discussion with other employees. But if we, you know, go, we're in a back room and we figure out, okay, here's what happened. Here's how we should have prevented it. And we're the only ones who know about it. We haven't delivered that information to anybody else. Of course, you can see what's wrong with that picture, right? I mean, we, we might have figured something out ourselves, but we haven't really uh, done anything to reduce the risk that it could happen again. So in one form or another, we need to ensure that every other affected employee knows, okay, here's, here's how we're going to change our process uh, in order to reduce that risk for the future. And, uh, you know, that can lead to a further discussion about any process changes that might be needed. Um, so those discussions, really, there should be kind of an open dialogue uh, uh, from employees and managers in that situation as well. So other key questions here to, to look at, are there any patterns that we're seeing in terms of accidents in the workplace? Um, and that, that can be more than just an employee injury, it can also be thinking about vehicle accidents, you know, property damage, facility related issues, that sort of thing. So um, really, they can all be evaluated the same way. And those will in turn affect potentially 
how and how frequently we're going to do a, a more comprehensive audit of the workplace. The safety committee is an important part of that discussion as well. I'm sure a lot of you have or possibly even sit on safety committees at your facility. Um, won't get too super detailed here, but uh, you know, the key things we want to think about is you know, how is that committee uh, uh, constructed? Who's on it? How are those people chosen? What is kind of their goal or their, their purview? Uh, do they have the authority to, to uh, act and communicate on behalf of the broader facility? Is that you know, if they're representative of the rest of the employees and managers? Uh, a few things that the uh, safety committee will probably be empowered to do are review and discuss the findings of, of recent audits so we can talk about corrective actions uh, that have either either should be implemented or have already been implement, implemented. Uh, we're going to talk about accidents in there as well uh, and ensure that that information is communicated to the rest of the staff at large by having uh, you know, thorough and, and uh, informative minutes being taken uh, for that meeting that are available to the rest of the staff. So it is important to think about who's in there. I, I have, I personally, I, I work with a number of committees that uh, have existed prior to my arrival. And I've seen kind of mixed results in terms of the, uh, the personnel involved. It, it could be just whoever was available when they were creating the roster and wanted that free lunch or whatever it might've been, or, you know, it can go all the way up to, you know, very specifically chosen people or volunteers better yet who, uh, not only can recognize safe, safety issues in their work area, but can and are they're comfortable with discussing them with others and trying to affect change in those areas uh, and, and really work together with the rest of the committee to try drive down risk uh, for, for really everybody else who's involved. Okay, on the home stretch here, folks, we have uh, a few options when we're considering the audit itself. Who's going to do the audit? Now we already spoke about having somebody who's, who's qualified and knowledgeable, that, that much is a given. Uh, but we do want to think beyond that. Are we going to do this all in-house? Do we have anybody internally who, who can check those boxes, who's knowledgeable in terms of uh, compliant changing regulations, uh, who, who has the not only the knowledge, but also the dedication and the, the ability to uh, do a subjective audit rather than to say, well, you know, you know what, I've, I've been familiar with that issue for a while. It's, it hasn't caused me any trouble before. I'm not going to note it down on this audit form because it, it doesn't seem to me like it's important. Um, that that might differ from an objective auditor, which sometimes you will find from that third party. Uh, in fact, that's one of the, the chief benefits of having a third party auditor. They have no stake in the game. They'll just say, here, here's what I see. Here's how it's an issue from either a regulatory or a loss control uh, point of view. Up to date on the changing regulations as well that uh, that in a lot of cases, facility personnel may not have the, the time or the ability to keep up with. Um, and obviously, if, if it's a third party consultant who's going into a variety of different facilities, or at least a high number of facilities, we'll be able to kind of share ideas and, and perspectives from other example, other uh, situations that have previously come up uh, that could be relevant for, for this particular audit. Now, there's not really one right answer here for, you know, which is the best um, or the most effective. And in reality, you, you probably want to have a combination of the two. Uh, because we can't just solely outsource this whole thing 100% to somebody else. Because one, one of the benefits, as I mentioned earlier, is that the third party auditor has, has no stake necessarily in the, uh, uh, the, the findings of the audit, which at the same time means it's the on-site personnel who are going to be responsible for uh, implementing corrective actions and who would be the most affected by any potential consequences uh, of, of inaction. So you have to have the, you know, the accountability internally in order to really drive any kind of effective change. So by having really both the in, uh, internal and external, the, the internal folks will be able to say, okay, here's our, our priorities based on our equipment or our circumstances, we'll have some customized checklist and, and be able to do more frequent self inspections internally, uh, be able to report that up the chain to our, our supervisors or our manager, manager chain. <clears throat> And of course, we'll be there right on site for any kind of immediate and emerging uh, safety or uh, environmental concerns. The third party consultant auditor, uh, they're going to have, again, the, the perspective and the, the uh, uh, objectivity I mentioned earlier, and they may also be able to help to develop that program. As I said earlier, uh, there may not necessarily be any, any, anyone on site who, who would be up to the task of creating uh, a effective and comprehensive audit, uh, excuse me, safety program. So the third party consultant might be able to help with that uh, and really to coach through 
some of the on-site uh, activities that would need to be done, like the accident investigation, potentially the safety committee functioning, uh, employee training, keeping up with compliance issues and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the other benefits you'll see here is if done correctly, the partnership between the third party consultant and the facility itself can demonstrate to the employees that the company it cares enough to invest time and resources and energy in their safety. And obviously there are other benefits in terms of uh, you know, regulatory pressure and so forth. But uh, the bottom line is that employee safety, of course, is a, a, one of the primary functions of doing any of this work at all. So the employees see, okay, I'm seeing some improvements in the workplace. Those are directly reducing my risk of an injury. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a good sign that the employer cares enough to do that. And that's obviously kind of a rosy uh, perspective, but it, it happens to be true is the good news is that, you know, that, um, that effort really does get noticed in my experience. Now, obviously, speaking of rosy, right, I mean, we all, we all like the idea of, uh, of having a safe workplace just for its own sake, but uh, most of you probably are, uh, you know, running a business or involved in the running of a business, and we want to think about dollars and cents as well. And that means we need to be thinking about the return on the investment that we might see as a result of these audits and inspections. And that can take a number of different forms. If we're thinking directly about insurance premiums, of course, it's kind of just a simple calculation. I mean, fewer injuries, you'll have a, a lower insurance premium. And that can be a pretty substantial difference if you're, if you're below the uh, kind of the industry rate for whatever industry you're in, you're going to see some significant savings on, on those costs. Um, and of course, more broad than that, is going to be just your own internal expenses um, as a res direct result of those injuries, uh, both well direct and indirect, really. And if we're thinking about things like lost time and lost production, I mean, those costs can really stack up pretty high and pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, again, the in many cases, the uh, financial benefit is going to be it's uh, uh, it's going to vastly outweigh the the amount of uh, time and effort that and, and money rather that you put into preventing that issue in the first place. The compliance side, we can't avoid that either, can't ignore it rather. Um, hopefully it's not our first and only motivation for doing any of this stuff because you know, in every regulation, even though they can sometimes be a little tricky to, uh, to get up to speed with, um, they are rooted from a place of keeping employees safe if we're talking about purely uh, safety regulations. Um, but that being said, you know, if we're avoiding OSHA uh, fines, regulatory pressure, Obviously, that has a direct benefit to your, your bottom line as well. Um, it's just, if nothing else, you're going to have a lower likelihood that they'll visit you in the first place. If you have fewer uh, severe injuries, if you have a good, robust safety culture, you're not likely as likely to see those employee complaints. In my experience, those complaints usually arise from just a lack of communication and lack of follow through. There may be some, some recognized safety concerns that employees and managers are both aware of. And if employees are seeing, you know what, this stuff just isn't getting addressed, I'm just as unsafe as I was two years ago, uh, that's when we start to see, you know, employees feel like they've exhausted their options and they're going to they're gonna try something else. They're going to call a regulatory agency. And that, uh, unfortunately, that's kind of like a last resort, if you will. Uh, so by staying ahead of all of this stuff, you reduce the risk of that call taking place and of potentially of that fine being levied against the facility itself. Uh, and, and when you have all those programs in place and, uh, you know, the audits are being done, corrective actions being implemented, that's going to create a great impression to those regulators uh, if and when they do arrive on site. So it, kind of the bottom line, all that, uh, you know, the, the financial benefits, both direct and indirect, are going to be felt over the long run, certainly, potentially even the short run. Um, but the, you know, the ultimate goal, of course, of any business is to, uh, to be profitable. And this is one, one of the important ways that you can help to meet that goal. So finally, we got it, we've done an audit. We've, we've looked through all of our corrective actions, or rather all of our deficiencies. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we do next? Uh, of course, the, the all important question here. So we need to think about really kind of the chief, uh, you know, kind of uh, components here, our communication, tracking, and follow through. So communication, of course, internally between the auditor and the affected managers as a starting point, and then the managers amongst themselves uh, to determine what are, or rather to understand what were the deficiencies noted, uh, how can we work to resolve them, right? That's the hard part. We, it's easy to point out what the problems are. The hard part comes when you have to actually implement those corrective actions. So to talking through ideas and solutions, um, you know, that's going to have to take place pretty quickly after the audit. 
and both sides of that, the deficiency of the observation and the corrective measure, those should all be tracked very clearly and very accessibly for everybody who would need to be involved in that discussion. Um, it's just going to, it's much more likely things would be, uh, would slip through the cracks if you don't have a good system to do this. Uh, and even if it's, you know, um, if it's all being documented somewhere, it, we have to make sure it's clear enough, both, again, the deficiency and the uh, the reason and the possible solution for that observation; those all have to be very clearly identified uh, for you know for everybody to be able to understand what's you know what are we actually trying to do here and are we doing it? It's kind of the bottom line. And good idea to look back through several years where I mean, hang on to those indefinitely because you get a lot of good data by looking through you know the last year's audit or two years ago, seeing what's changed in the meantime and what hasn't changed sometimes. And of course, the follow through. As I say, kind of the hard part, right? We have to actually implement those corrective actions that we uh, that we discussed and we determined were necessary. How is that being documented? How is that being implemented? How quickly is it being done? So, timely manner, of course, is uh, is really the answer to all of those things. We have to, you know, some, some of course corrective measures will take longer than others. Just a, a simple uh, uh, matter of practicality and cost in some cases, but um, there should at least be a plan in place not too long after the audit has been has been completed. So back to our questions, because we're always asking more questions when we're doing an audit. So how are we tracking those results and the corrective actions? Again, maybe different for every every one of you on the call. It might be pen and paper, it might be an Excel sheet, it might be a, a proprietary you know, software that's gonna help to track all this stuff for you. Do we have any repeat issues? Very important to look at. You know, it helps to identify, again, where you should focus your efforts the most, where you might be most likely to have uh, an actual incident occur. You'd rather keep all this stuff on paper in the audit before it becomes a problem so you can correct it in time. But you know, the more these things show up again and again, of course, the higher probability that something actually could go wrong that is outside of the audit. What kind of accountability do the managers have? Is there any kind of, you know, anybody holding them to task uh, after the audit to say, okay, you've had this thing for six months now. I haven't seen the corrective actions. What's, what's next? Uh, that may or may not be the auditor themselves. It sort of depends on the, the structure of uh, of your company, your organization. Um, but certainly, the the effective managers should be there. Should be some level of uh, expectation that corrective measures will be implemented by those managers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when are we going to do, when will we do another audit? Again, answer is going to be different depending on the facility, the results of that audit. You may just stick to a prescribed schedule, should be regular, as we talked about earlier, a regular schedule. Um, but sometimes you'll have to uh, do, do it a little bit more frequently if the results of the audit kind of dictate that that is necessary. And finally, how are we going to communicate that to the employees? I spoke earlier about communication among the affected managers, but the employees probably should be in the loop as well for a lot of these things because they're the ones who are, uh, you know, potentially the ones who are um, committing the infractions, if you will, or at least the direct observation of those infractions will, will involve the employees. So it brings us back to the questions we discussed earlier, which I won't rehash all of them, but you know, did we have a program in place? What does our training program look like? How are we delivering that, that information, et cetera? Uh, so if, if you're, you're seeing consistently some problems in a specific area, those employees, of course, will have to be coached through um, what those corrective measures will look like. And uh, just to kind of wrap all that up is when it comes to the employee side of things, I spoke a little bit earlier about this as well, uh, but just to make it a little bit clear, if we're talking about uh, how to get our employees to follow along with our policies and programs, we do need to look at both the positive and the negative side of things, the positive enforcement, excuse me, positive incentives and the enforcement of our policies but through means such as uh, you know, a disciplinary write-up and it can escalate from there, of course, which takes a lot of, of course, uh, willpower and effort to to push through and to actually follow through with. That's that's what I see being the hardest for a lot of shops, but um, that's where it sometimes becomes very necessary if you're actually trying to achieve these goals. Uh, there has to be some kind of follow up mechanism to ensure that employees are going to do what what they should do. And when you're thinking about positive incentives, if if you're not familiar with that that term or that idea, it, it's important to look at what we're incentivizing. Because if we if we say, all right, I'm going to you know, throw a, a, like a company lunch or, or whatever every month that we don't have a workplace accident or something like that. Now, indirectly, what I've probably just done potentially is 
I've incentivized people not to report accidents because they really love that lunch or whatever it is. Uh, and they don't want to wind up on the list. They don't want to be the one who ruins it for everybody else. So, um, you know, it's, it, it gives people an incentive to do to sort of to hide the data, if you will, to, to not get information where it needs to go. So instead, and I, I mentioned one of my smart goals earlier, I want to observe 100% adherence to our eye protection policy or whatever policy it might be. That's more of a behavior incentive. I'm, I'm incentivizing good behavior rather than the results of that behavior. So, so similar token, if I say I want to uh, incentivize, I say I, I'll throw a lunch for everybody if I don't have an eye injury, or I say, I'll throw a lunch for everybody if I see everybody wearing the right PPE. Again, one of those goals is going to be much more uh, effective than the other in terms of incentivizing the result that I want. So the bottom line here, again, one more refrain on this one is that the auditor inspection by itself is really not going to do anything for your, your overall safety uh, programs and, and, the, and the performance of your facility. It's one piece of the puzzle and a very important piece but by itself, it's not going to achieve the goal. There has to be a lot of follow through afterwards uh, to ensure that it's going to have any impact at all. And when it's properly executed, the audit and inspection process, it can help to, of course, keep everybody safer and minimize risk, but also improve efficiency and profitability by eliminating or reducing the likelihood of any kind of uh, you know, losses that your facility would incur, either on the injury side or the facility side or the production loss side. The safety culture just organically will start to improve the more routine this process becomes. And then you're going to start to see that sort of feedback cycle from your employees and the managers um, when, when it's recognized that we're seeing the result of our efforts, um, again, becomes kind of a self-sustaining machine that everybody can either, you know, knowingly or otherwise, um, just becomes part of how they, how they work every day. And that's the ultimate goal we're trying to reach here. And finally, because what's, what's more fun than auditing? It's going to be auditing our audits. We need to think about, is the audit process itself that we've implemented, is that working well enough? Are we missing anything? Is there anything that we, need, we think we need to target differently? Uh, so we need to not only evaluate the facility and our programs, but the way in which we're evaluating them. Um, because if, if you may have uh, had the same auditor for 20 years and you're not seeing any improvement of any kind, or all of a sudden you get um, you know, a regulatory audit or whatever the case may be. And it turns out, well, we've been missing these, you know, two dozen things we should have been focused on. Uh, well, it's time to revisit how we're doing the audit, maybe who's doing it or how they're going about it. So um, the work isn't done, even if we have the programs in place and we have the training and we have the audits in place. Again, we still have to think critically about how we're going about all of these items. Which brings us to our timely conclusion. I thank you all for your time and attention and uh, more than happy to open it up to questions here uh, in the remaining minutes. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for this uh, fantastic and insightful presentation. And before we start the q and I wanna remind everyone about the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. Your input is important because it'll help us improve our future webcast. And as a reminder, uh, if you want to ask a question, click the Q&A button, type your question, and click the send button. So let's get to some questions. Um, first one, um, what qualifications does OSHA require for performing safety audits? It's a good question. I mean, it's um, when it comes to auditing, there's really not a like a certification or a credential. It comes down primarily to... Um, I guess you could just say the the merits of that individual i mean there are of course safety certifications asp csp and so forth uh that kind of lend credence to the um the credibility of the auditor um but there isn't like a um a safety auditor license or credential or that sort of thing that really the, the key is does that individual know um really what they're looking for what they're looking at can they communicate uh those concerns, those deficiencies, those potential corrective measures effectively. Um, so a little bit more hard to pin down in a specific way. Um, it, and in that way, it can be harder to vet, if you will. So you really have to look holistically at what, what credentials does that person have that would uh, make them a good fit for you. Our next question, you spoke about records earlier uh, mm -hmm. in this presentation. So uh, can you answer how long do we need to keep a PFT records, CDL medical records, audiogram results, respirator fit testing results, et cetera, et cetera? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, different uh, different time frames for uh, for different um, I guess sections primarily. Uh, medical records it dictate. I mean, a lot of these are dictated by the regulation. Medical records have to be kept for I believe it's thirty years after the employee has left the company. Um, so that would I believe likely qualify for CDL medical records, audiogram results as well, um, respirator fit testing. So that's done annually. A lot of times you'll see OSHA goes back three to five years, or really any regulatory agency. EPA does the same thing about three years. Um, in a lot of cases, we just it, it's it's just a best practice to keep those indefinitely as well. Um, but uh, in the case of uh, like daily inspections or that kind of thing, it might be a little bit cumbersome. So for personnel records, again, medical is thirty. But if it's not medical, we're, we're talking beyond that. It's it's going to be in that three to five year range. Our next question, how soon can I expect to start to see a return on investment after I start an audit or inspection program? Yeah, right. Dollars and cents, right? We spoke a little bit about it earlier. Um, naturally, there's going to be a lot of variability here. Um, you know, it, it really, we, we recognize, of course, that safety is an ongoing concern. It never goes away. So as I said, we're kind of moving the goalpost constantly. Uh, in reality and in theory, the, uh, well, I guess those are opposites, in theory anyway, the, uh, the returns, they could begin really as soon as the corrective actions are implemented. Um, it can be a bit hard to define. Uh, one of the tricky things about um, sort of encouraging a robust safety and uh, corrective actions, pro actions program is that the benefits of that loss control, they can be hidden, right? And we, we, we don't know about the accident that we prevented, at least not in the short term. Um, so it, it's hard to define, like, I guess after six months, I know I saw this return. Sometimes we have to look at a little bit longer term to have a, a good idea of, have enough data really to know what kind of return we got. If we're thinking about, you know, hey, it's been three years since we, we completely revamped uh, our audit process and got a lot better at implementing corrective actions. And wouldn't you know it, our insurance premiums have gone down. We've had fewer accidents. Uh, you know, when we're talking about those kind of trends, they can take a little bit longer to, uh, to identify. Uh, but again, in, in theory, that can really begin day one. Um, if we're seeing, you know, uh, rather the, uh, we're thinking about kind of that hidden, hidden benefit. Our next question, I guess, how would you apply this approach to contract construction projects perform an owner, you know, a, a prime with subs? I'll have to be careful here. I, I personally haven't been too involved with, with the construction side of things. Um, so I don't wanna to speak too far out of turn. Primarily we've dealt directly with, uh, with facility management itself. Um, in general, uh, you know, facility related item, or the, the conditions of the workplace um, that affect both employees and subcontractors uh, will, will be the responsibility of whoever owns and operates that facility. Um, so it's, uh, again, there's a sort of a different set of regulations for general industry and construction. And I, I do apologize to, to the person who asked the question and my expertise is not in the construction domain. Um, but I believe there would be some similarity there in that the, uh, the owner and operator would, would have to ensure that the, this, the facility itself is safe enough for those subcontractors as well. So do you have any guidance on following up with safety audits? Uh, what should my level of participation be after performing an audit? So it, it really depends on the facility and the, the I guess, the, um, the way in which that audit um, program has been developed. Um, I mean, this is really where it gets so important to have good tracking and good software to, uh, to uh, keep track of all of the issues and the corrective actions um, so that it's much easier to communicate those findings between the auditor and the, the facility. Um, it, it depends in part on whether the auditor is a employer, or, excuse me, a manager of the, uh, in that company, or if it's a third party, I would say at certainly at an absolute minimum, the auditor should be involved with, of course, communicating the findings, you know, in a timely manner immediately after the audit to the, to the facility, uh, as well as helping them to figure out some corrective actions, um, whether or not they do a, a re-audit um, or the frequency with which they're, they're checking back in will, will vary greatly depending on, again, the circumstances of the facility and the audit, but um, it, where it may not be feasible or practical for the auditor to come back out that often. 
Um, but certainly, again, the communication side, uh, the auditor in a lot of cases will have a good read on whether or not corrective actions have been done. And if there are things that are lingering or, or um, not done satisfactorily, uh, that should spark a conversation between at least the auditor to check in to say, you know, with, with maybe somebody higher up in, in that manager chain uh, to find out what what has been done, why hasn't that been done. Uh, but of course, the at the end of the day, the ultimate responsibility lies with the facility itself. And that may not include the auditor if they're somewhat outside of that chain of command. Uh, do you have any tips on what's often overlooked in audits and inspection programs? I think the in, in the experience I've had, probably the most, uh, I guess the best answer to that question would be the verification of the employee's understanding uh, of the safety programs and the expectations of the, the workplace. Again, I, I mentioned a couple of times, I mean, it's great to have the program, but how are we verifying the employees actually understand what's expected of them? That may not always be evident from a walkthrough of the facility. Sometimes it, it, we're talking about things like lockout, tagout, or an emergency response scenario or a spill cleanup. Um, those conditions may not be present during the audit. Uh, so the, the facility really should have some way of doing sort of hands-on instruction or, or hands-on verification uh, of that understanding rather than just having people you kind of just sign off a, a sheet of paper in most cases to say, you know, I was at that training. Um, because one thing you can you can certainly see is, uh, you know, three months, six months, however long after the training has been done, uh, if if a deficiency is observed during the audit or even uh, in just a subsequent kind of Q and A uh, discovery session, it may become evident that well they didn't really retain that information that well, which can bring us back to how was that training delivered, uh, and what what kind of measures do we have to verify understanding. So are there any good audit tools slash checklists you would recommend? Uh, well, certainly are. I mean, and speaking uh, somewhat, uh, well, both biased and uh, from experience is uh, KPA does have its own proprietary software to not only to help us do our audits at our, uh, at our client facilities, but to help those facilities do some of their own internal inspections as well. Uh, and to some extent do their own audits um, if they're if they have some familiarity with kind of how to go about it themselves so i mean we're we're not the only game in town i won't i won't make that claim but um the software that we use it basically just pairs you know a, a photograph of the observation the, the applicable regulation you know something that's going to have the reason uh for the the write-up as well as kind of the plain english version you know what does it mean how does it affect you and obviously, at the end of all that is how can we work to um, to correct that issue, to just wipe the slate clean, so to speak, for that particular circumstance and, and reduce the risk uh, in general. So something that's going to achieve all those goals and also be able to be kind of archived so we can look back through the history uh, of however long it's been since these audits began. Uh, that's going to help to to keep this stuff organized, uh, even if personnel changes. You know, if the person who did the audits five years ago, maybe they had a spreadsheet or a notebook, but then they leave. Uh, people can't decipher their handwriting, whatever it is. Uh, we need to make sure that every other stakeholder involved there is able to quickly jump in and have a user friendly way to uh, uh, to navigate all this stuff and pick up where that previous person left off. Well, as we uh, wrap up here, do you have any uh, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, I will, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just get this going here. I will just say as a bonus offer here, KPA is, uh, is, is going to offer uh, all of our uh, attendees the free audits and inspections ebook. That information will be sent out to, uh, to everyone who's on the call today uh, or those who are, are listening remotely. Um, and that hopefully will help to give you some ideas of, of um, not only what we talked about today, but how you can kind of think about what are we doing at our own facility and how can we kind of turn this around and revamp what we've done so far. Uh, so stay tuned for that information. Uh, and as on a personal note, once again, I, I really appreciate everybody's time and attention and all the thoughtful questions. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak with all of you. I hope, hope you thought a little bit about how your facility fits into everything we've been discussing today. Um, and you can see some ways uh, you know, to, you can cherry pick out to say, okay, you know what, that's, that's something we wanna be thinking a little bit more closely about. So um, once again, thank you all for your time. And I hope uh, everyone has a great rest of the day and enjoy the other, uh, the other seminars. 
Well, yes, thank you, everyone. And unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsor. Again, we also hope you take the time to share your feedback through our survey. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I thank Mike Brenner, our sponsor, KPA, and of course, everyone who joined us today. Take care and be safe.